All right, it's uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Time to prep some Dungeons and Dragons. Um, next Wednesday, we've got the September 2020 Hero Quest. We do a Hero Quest adventure once a month till we run through all 14 Hero Quest adventures. Uh, exciting news for Hero Quest: there should be a big announcement from Hasbro, who now owns the rights to Hero Quest about either a re-release or a brand new game um that announcement will be in i think two two days something like that so that's kind of exciting um yeah so this is gonna be the first dungeon well not really the first dungeon i built a dungeon already in in foundry but this will be the first hero quest dungeon built in foundry and it'll be the first dungeon i've built since i learned to use all the modules that i have picked out or selected so, um, let me share a bunch of stuff in the chat before we get going, and that will maybe make things make a little bit more sense uh, as we're going. So, this is the link that tells you when the big announcement for Hero Quest is coming out. There we go. And this is the document that I use to keep track of all of my foundry stuff. So if you see weird stuff going on in my foundry, these are the mods that are making that weird stuff happen in my foundry game. All right, so let's go ahead and join this session and get started. One of the things I will need to double check is I did some last minute changes to one of my modules in a different game. So I'm going to have to go and make sure that the same settings for minor quality of life are in both places. So I have to turn off combat enhancements because we're no longer going to use combat enhancements because it fights with turn tracker and everybody loved turn tracker. So turn tracker is going to win out that popularity uh, fight right there. And then we're going to go to uh, save those changes, which will reboot everything. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, just got to tweak a couple of settings before we start building. All right. And then we're going to go over to configure the settings, modules. We're going to go down to minor quality of life. And we want to make sure that we turn off speed item rolls, I guess. Uh, and then we want to make sure that walls block, check to see, save results, prompt players uh, to use let me roll that for you. So that's pretty cool. What this basically means is if they get targeted by an area of effect attack, it won't automatically roll their saving throws for them. It will give them the illusion of having some kind of control over their lives and be like, you can roll for it. And then it'll be like, okay, you're screwed. And they get 30 whole seconds to do so before it rolls for them anyways. Uh, let's see. Yes, and undo damage. Untarget the dead. Okay. This is all correct. And borders for chat. Sweet. All right. We got to go over here. And change my color to obnoxious pink. So everybody knows it's me. All right, now I have built a new homepage for HeroQuest since um, in the migration, the homepage did not survive the migration process. Yeah, only 10 more days, so I have to have everything ready. It's great. Um, but yeah, we've got our animated candles. Uh, we got our house rules, all that good stuff. Uh, I would say better than before. You do it the second time, it's better than the first time. So now we got to make quest 11, now that we have all our settings correct. So in order to make a new scene, we go over to this kind of map looking icon. We go down and we create a scene. And in the scene, we're going to call this quest 11. That was easy. Um, I guess we could be more descriptive at this point. So we'll call it Bastion of Chaos because... Well, no. If we make the name too big, it'll be really big up there at the top, too. So, we'll keep a uniform um, system here. So, let's do 
uh, HQ space Q11. Yeah, much better. Okay. And now we have to set a map for this. All right. So the map we're going to set for this, I already have it downloaded and on my computer. It is this loveliness right here, the Bastion of Chaos. And what I need, because Foundry is uh, cumbersome, is I have to go in and look at the properties of it. Uh, so under the details, I got to make sure that I know how many pixels it is and what the DPI is. That's actually very important for Foundry. So if you don't know how to access this information, I will show you. Hopefully I don't have anything too offensive on my desktop. Um, in a Windows machine, you go to the file, you right click on it, you go down to properties, and then you go to details. It's the third tab over. And scroll down, it'll tell you the dimensions, which are uh, 4200 by 4200. And then it's 72 DPI. All right. It's like, why do I need to know all that stuff? I will show you right now. All right. Uh, this map is also, according to the vendor, I want to say it's a 30 by 30 map. Let me get my calculator out real quick. I could probably just go check, but if I've got 4,200 and I divide it by 72, that doesn't work out at all. Hmm. Okay, hold on. If I got 4,200 and I divide it by 30, that would say each square would be 140. Wow. I haven't gotten the algebra of these maps quite quite perfect yet. Let's give it a shot. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go to Appearance, Background Image. I'm going to go to my Asset Library, and I'm going to go to Worlds, even though I should be keeping it in a map folder. I Since I migrated everything over, um, I already have like this mess, so I might as well just own it. So I'm going to go in here and put uh, HQ underscore Q11. All right, I'm going to go in here, and this is the file, or the, yeah, where I'm going to upload it to, the folder where I'm going to upload it to. So let's find that. Uh, where are you? <laughs> there it is. All right, I've chosen this, and it's uploaded. All right, grab it, select it, and it's good. Now you'll notice that it didn't adjust these numbers or anything. It didn't do anything useful or helpful at all. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and update that to be 4200 and 4200. I'm going to change my background to be black. And then I'm going to go to grid size. And I'm going to guess that it's 140. Because I don't know any better. And then I'm going to go down here and save it. Oh, wait. I'm also going to turn off... Advanced Fog of War, because I hate it. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and save. And it's thinking, and it's thinking, and it's doing stuff. And maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. Uh, there's a good chance that it did. We got a thumbnail for it. Let me click on it. Uh, up here. Alright. So, here's the dungeon. It is hard to tell if the grid is the right size or not. Ugh, hold on. I'm going to go just check. Uh, I'm going to drag over a person. That might be the easiest way. Let's see. All right. Oh, yeah. So Ragnar come out, spawn all them hit points. Uh, I'm going to say that this is not the right size. Hmm. Okay. So let's see. All right, heroic maps, fortress of chaos. What what is the grid size here, guys? Uh, 140 pixels. Yeah, that's what I said it at. It's a 30 by 30 map. 
So why is it laying out so poorly? All right, let's check the settings again to make sure they're correct. Uh, oh, here we go. Even though I told it, and we have it recorded that I did so, I changed it to 4200, but Foundry decided it didn't like those numbers. So it made it a different size. I've had this happen quite a few times. Uh, so if I go here and I tilt the correct amount and I go here and I do the correct grid size and I save it, it should, there we go. Now you can see everything's laying out the way it's supposed to. Um, some map makers uh, actually include this information now. So the map we're using can be found here. And you can see in the description, it tells you what the pixel count uh, is for for this map. So you're going to need that sort of stuff uh, if you are trying to import your map into Foundry and want it to fit uh, correctly to the grid. All right, so that was the first hurdle in making a Foundry dungeon. Yeah, yeah, the, I, I don't think it's a Foundry issue. I should also mention that, that I am not 100% on just Foundry. I'm also using a service called The Forge, uh, which is a hosting service that also... Can you guys hear that horrible sound in the background? Because that's my pug, and she's eating her water a water bottle, and it probably sounds horrible. Uh, hold on. I will chase her away. <laughs> take, take take your water bottle and go. Get out of here. Really you, you adorable little gremlin. Let's go, baby. Yeah, eat your water bottle somewhere else. Uh, okay. Alright, yeah. So I'm using the forge. I'm using the... Um, Jesus. I'm using the forge for my hosting. And... These guys for my maps and that Google document right there will take you to the mods that I'm using. All right. So in roll 20, when we make a dungeon, the first thing we do is we take a lovely rectangle tool and we draw a rectangle tool in the dynamic lighting layer to create a bounding box around the entire dungeon. Well, you can't do that in Foundry. So what we're going to do is we're going to toggle on by clicking this plus sign right here. Uh, snap to grid and we're going to draw uh, our own we're gonna draw our own and I'm holding down control while I do this and it allows me to poop out extra joints uh, yeah sure just a sec and then to end it I double click or is that just the polygon tool I can't ever remember uh, then I go in here and I double check yeah that is a nice bounding box that we have created. And I'm going to get, I'm going to set up my night bot uh, to just randomly post like they're using these mods because mods are such a cornerstone of Foundry that I want to make sure people know like when we're doing something like, oh yeah, you're, they're, they're doing this. So I also found out today that you can get skins for Foundry. So if you want your, like Greek Odyssey game to look more Greek and you are good at say graphic design, you could go in and you could like change up the entire interface so that it is like Greek themed. Uh, or if you're running a Pokemon game, somebody released a Pokemon skin for Foundry. So it changes everything to be Foundry. Did I make this map? Oh, I am so flattered that you would say that. No, um, the link for the map is just a little bit further up in chat. Uh, I got the map from Heroic Maps. Who are my favorite map makers? I'm very sad because the main artist for them, uh, he got stabbed in the eye by a baby. So he can't see right now. <laughs> it was his own baby, I think. Uh, not 100% sure on the details. All right, let's go ahead and dynamically light this thing. I am excited that this is the first adventure that we are running in Foundry because it's a super basic bitch adventure. Uh, it is called... Uh, the Bastion of Chaos. Uh, so let's just review that real quick. Uh, Bastion of Chaos, Quest 11. Um, the Empire wants you to go into the heart of darkness, essentially. So dangerous, they have to teleport you in 
uh, for this mission, and they want you to kill the four big boss Chaos Warriors of the Chaos Army. Each of the four Chaos Warriors represents one of the four gods of Chaos. So, in the OG HeroQuest adventure, you got a shitload, by the standards of HeroQuest, money for every bad guy you killed. So, you just went on an absolute murder spree through this dungeon. Um, I'm not... I, we already give out plenty of treasure in Hero Quest, so we're probably not going to do that. But we are going to have like a like a killing spree award. So the more people you kill, the more powerful you become, and it just like steamrolls into this insane uh, ultra power situation. I'll probably even start pulling in some Giphy Gliss mechanics that you could like you every every five dudes you kill, you can spend a hit die as if you had taken a, a short rest or whatever. And then, like, if you get to, like, 10 kills or 15 kills, you gain the benefits of a short rest uh, as far as regaining your abilities and stuff like that. But as soon as you actually take a short rest, um, you lose your kill count, and it really sets to zero. And then this adventure will not allow a long rest because you're essentially in the middle of the bad guy's inner sanctum. There's, there's just no opportunities for that. So I think that'll be a fun way to sort of honor the original adventure of being just murder hobo paradise. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. All right. Um, but before we can do any of that fun stuff, we need to dynamically light it. So uh, here we go. Um, I want to disable by clicking this little plus button again. You can barely tell that it's turned off, but I want to turn off snap to grid. And I start drawing by left-clicking and dragging. Then I start holding down the control key so that I will spawn more... Uh, I call them joints because it reminds me a lot of 3D modeling days when I would build joints for um, game models. So that's what I call it. Um, then to continue where you left off, um, I superstitiously hold down control but I think it always wants to continue from where you left off anyways. Uh, let me see. If I just start drawing again, nope. So you, you do have to hold down control to continue where you left off. All right. And I click that joint and I pull out and I keep going. Now, you do want to minimize the amount of joints you have in your scene. Um, every joint is another calculation that Foundry has to make for lighting. Um, and per, you know, the Foundry team, it is the number one way to kind of slow down your Foundry experience is to have too many uh, independent joints on your lighting. So in this hallway, I zoomed way out and I just dragged that joint all the way down the hallway so I have one nice big straight line uh, rather than a bunch of smaller joints because that would have been unnecessary. And then holding down control, clicking on that joint, and continuing, I draw some more. Now, what I love about the Foundry dynamic lighting system is I could just pick up those joints and move them around. So if I didn't put it in the right place or I didn't make it as long as I needed to, I can simply grab it and just keep going, which is amazing. All right. Uh, and this is another long straight away, so I'm going to zoom out. Hold down control, click that joint, and go to the end of the hallway. We don't want to snap to grid here, even though we could, because we don't want to hide the edges of the wall. Um, players panic if they can't see the artwork for the wall. Um, yeah, I could. Uh, mostly I do that out of superstition, because I like to store things in the margins of my map. And if somebody was carrying a torch and their miniature... Uh, and they phase through the wall, something that happens in Roll20 all the time, and something that can happen in Foundry. I like, uh, I don't want them to see everything that's living outside of the dungeon, so I still create a bounding box around my dungeons, even in Foundry. And I think Foundry understands that, because the migration tool um, from Kakaroto, that is actually one of the settings on the Foundry tool, or the migration tool, is do you want to make a bounding box around your map? Um, so yeah, I, th I think boundary box is still a best practice if you are the kind of person who stashes things in the margins. All right. Uh, let's see. Then we can go up here and we'll click 
and start a new line. Oh, whoa. Ah, that was weird. And I have noticed a pattern with myself at least that I have been making, I guess, more jagged um, dynamic lighting since I came over to Foundry uh, just because I want to minimize the amount of joints that I'm creating. Whereas in roll 20, I would, you know, go, go nuts trying to like trace the details of the map. Um, I think maybe if I'm being honest with myself, that could have been some of the problems that I was having with roll 20 was that I was having too many different angles that needed to be calculated. I don't know for sure. It's hard to say because there were so many different problems in roll 20 that both myself and others were having. It's kind of hard to quantify what's what anymore. All right. Another thing I like about it is these joints uh, can go in multiple directions. So where there's an intersection like that, I can make a joint and drop it down and come back to it later, uh, which is pretty cool. So anytime there's an intersection, I'll often add a joint so that I could do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Terrain Tool does allow you to see um, into the terrain, but not through the terrain, uh, which could be cool here for the skulls. I could make it so that you can see the skulls in the wall, but you can't climb on the skulls on the wall. Um, I'll, I guess I could do that right now just to demonstrate, but if I grab this um, mountain uh, icon right here, I hold down Control, and I start drawing, and you can see that it is green, instead of, uh, I don't know, yellow, beige, whatever that color is. And if I do that, you should be able to see these guys, but not see through them, which is pretty neat. Um, so technically, I wouldn't need this wall in the back here, but I'll probably leave it anyways, because I'm really superstitious about people going through the walls. And until I know for sure how that works in Foundry, um, that's how I'm going to do it. But once we get done lighting, we can come back here and check this and check it out. Uh, oh, yeah. And your comment there about most of the maps being pre-made. So if I go over to Manage Modules, you can see that there's a bunch of maps here, like uh, Damil's Wondrous Works and uh, Mika Weiwa's Battle Map Bundle. Yeah, there's all these bundles of maps that are available for Foundry that are already dynamically lit for you. You don't have to do anything. You just turn them on. You get a little compendium here. You drag the scenes in that you want, and the maps are all ready to go. It's amazing. All of those bundles right now are completely free. Um, or at least they, they came with my Forge membership. But I know there's a lot of map makers who are trying to kind of jump on that foundry hype train and they are making a bunch of map uh, compendiums that you can just get for free for uh, this program. Sizu Piku, uh, you know, they're making like $20,000 a map pack right now. <laughs> they're, they're doing pretty good for themselves. Uh, they have for, I think it's if you, if you do $5 a map pack, you can get all of their maps as foundry ready. Uh, they're all ready to use in Foundry. You don't have to do any of the work that I'm doing right now on those Season Piku maps. So, yeah. Some really great opportunities right now um, for people getting into Foundry to save time and effort. So, maybe Heroic Maps will get on board for that? I don't know. Uh, in the meantime, I could certainly use the practice of uh, kind of prepping these maps. So... I don't mind that much. Gotta gotta learn and master these new skills. All right. Uh, let's see. We'll just keep going. Oh, and see what just happened there. That is an issue that happens quite a bit. Uh, you think you're starting a new area, and it's like, wouldn't it be cool if we continued from this joint over here? And it's like, no, that's not cool at all. Uh, and I think that's just a known issue that they're working on in Foundry. 
Uh, yeah, Dungeon Draft, there is actually a mod that will auto-dynamically uh, light your dungeon. So you build it in Dungeon Draft, and then there's a way to export it so that when it comes into Foundry, the mod will automatically uh, dynamically light it, add walls, all that stuff for you automatically. Yeah, I mean, this is this is some really good stuff happening right now. One thing that I wish you could do, I do wish you could select more than one wall joint at a time. See, I wanted to move both of these joints over, but I have to grab one and then grab the other. It would be nice if I could just move uh, both joints at once. That does not uh, seem to be a thing you could do at this time. Alright. And... I still have the bad habit of wanting to trace the walls more than I probably need to. I don't know how how long I'm going to keep doing that before I, I stop, but hopefully it doesn't screw up my performance uh, too bad. Like here, I could have just owned that the wall was extra thick, but I went ahead and, and added this in anyways. Maybe not a best practice. I guess time will tell. I want to say that this isn't a very big map, so it shouldn't be an issue, but you never really know. And I have butted up against some performance issues so far with animation. Um, it is much better for animation than Roll20 was, and there are some really, really great mods that allow animation that do not hurt your resources, but straight up, like, animated stuff, um, web, uh, what is it, WebMs, and um, MP4 files that you use for maps and stuff, uh, those are really cool, and they do work, but there is certainly a limit to the scene. Like, you can't just, you can't just animate everything. Uh, eventually, people are going to have some issues running the maps. But I really like how adaptive the dynamic lighting um, wall tool is. I think it's I think it's great, and it's one of those things that you have to remember. This program only became publicly available in February, and it's already amazing. Um, so over here, this is going to be an interesting thing. We've got this cell, so I'm going to make the cell uh, invisible so that you. Whoops. Uh, you can see through it, right? Because you'd be able to see through a cell. But you can't walk through it. So that's what the invisible wall does, which is pretty neat. Uh, another thing you could do is you've got this gate, this uh, prison gate. And you wouldn't be able to uh, walk through it until you opened it, right? And, but you would be able to see through it. So what you could do is while you're on the wall tool, you could select the door, or that the piece that you want to be the door. And if you double click on it, it brings up the settings for the wall, and you could just say that it is a see-through door, and update it. And now players can see through it, but they can't walk through it, but they could open it, but as a DM, I can lock it. So now I have a locked see-through door. It's very, very cool. All right, but we're not doing doors yet. Uh, let's finish doing the walls. So let's see. Got some more over here. All right. I'll occasionally, and I don't know if this is the best practice or not, when I'm using the wall tool, I'll occasionally just left click on the map to clear its memory. I, again, I don't know if any of this actually works or if I'm just blowing on Nintendo cartridges at this point. But it seems to cut down on the amount of times it randomly chooses a joint to draw from. So I might be onto something. I don't know. All right. And then if you want to terminate what you're doing, you can always right click and that will terminate whatever line you're doing and not drop a joint, which is cool. All right. So over here, we got some battlements. Uh, We'll just do something like this. There we go. Now, you know what? For battlements, we could have done instead 
uh, we could have done the terrain. So what we could do now, since I already drew them, is we could select them all as a group, double click on one of them, and then we could change it so that it is limited perception, which will make it into a terrain wall instead. And you could change the whole group at once, which is awesome. Uh, and then I could actually grab all these at once and kind of move them so they're more in the center. So you get that terrain effect from both directions. So you could see, you'll probably be able to see most of this without too much interruptions. Um, we could test it, of course, once we drop some, some minis in here. All right. Uh, let's see. Regular walls is just this weird hamburger. So... Holding down control to drop extra joints as we go. Trying to make nice straight lines whenever possible. All right. Zooming back in. Holding down control. Clicking on the joint that we want to start from. And I am zooming in and out using my mouse wheel. Uh, I'm not holding down any keys to activate the zoom. I'm just using the mouse wheel and it zooms. I don't know. If that is from a macro, or not a macro, excuse me, a module or not, um, it's hard to keep track at this point. That's why I post all the mods that I'm using, um, so that if, you, if you're trying to do things the way I'm doing it, those are the mods that I am using. All right. Drag up to here. Now, I do wish you could pan while you are holding a joint. <laughs> I don't know how many subs are going to say holding a joint in this video. Um, because it would be really great if I'm in the middle of drawing and then I could go and kind of check. Hey, I don't, I don't want to go any further here. All right. Uh, here is a secret door. So this is a great opportunity. So I can just draw a normal wall and keep going. And then I could grab this and just tell it that it is a secret door. Now, one thing that kind of sucks about... <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing that kind of sucks about secret doors is that when you are DM, they just look like a normal door icon. There's no way to know that it's a secret door. Uh, you could definitely lock it, which is a good idea, uh, because you don't want players to accidentally open it. Um, though I guess accidentally opening a secret door is kind of on brand for a secret door. So that's sort of immersive. I'm not 100% sure I want to lock secret doors now that I think about it. Um, yeah, you know what? Let's leave them unlocked. I think that'd be kind of cool. But what you do want to do maybe is go to your marker tool and just draw like a big old S or something. And then put that S on the GM's layer so that you you know it's a secret door. Uh, journal note, that's way more classy. That's way more classy. Uh, I'm just going to put a big pink S that I drew with a crayon. Um, but your idea is, you know, much better and cool too. Uh, I will take note of that. Um, all right, let's keep going. So I'm going to hold out control to continue from where I left off. All right, and we'll go to about here, and we'll drop way too many joints. There we go, and we'll keep going. All right, this one's going to be a pain. Uh, there is no good way to make circular things. They are working on a new type of wall called an arc. An arch? Yeah, I think it's called an arch. Um, and the arch will, um, sort of like if you've done any vector work in like Illustrator or even in Photoshop, when you draw one of these, you can then bend it, right? You can make it a bendy line. That's what they're going to do to handle curves. So I am pretty, pretty excited. What the hell? Where did that extra, what the, <laughs> where are these extra drops coming from? That was weird. Okay. So yeah, you won't have these clunky N64 um, low polygon curves in, I guess, the next update for Foundry. They're going to add curves in there. Oh, you can you can mouse with the... Let's see. All right, I'm going to 
have one of these guys. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, well, that solves one problem. Thank you, great sage of Foundry. All right, bring this over here. Yeah, I, don't, I think we'll just let this one be a big thick wall at this point because I'm getting tired of making walls. I will say that I am a heck of a lot faster building walls in Roll20, though. A heck of a lot faster. And I'm sure this is just one of those things that the longer you do it, eventually it will be no big deal. But for now, I feel, I feel very slow. Um, very, very slow. I am tempted as well um, to not do my doors uh, separately, but to actually just draw the doors now that I know I can go back in and change them. Because I feel like it would be better to have a solid wall someplace uh, than to forget the door entirely. But again, I'm still trying to figure out the best the best workflow for for me, for for Foundry, so on and so forth. So I think I'll leave some of the doors blank and I'll draw some of the doors and I'll see which one feels better uh, when it's time to add the doors back in. But I don't know. I I do I do like it. I've finally kind of gotten over the newness of it, which is a good feeling to finally have a sense of like, hey, I I might actually be able to to use this program. And now I definitely want to make a uh, a video that's like, hey, players who are gonna play in Foundry with me, this is what this is what we're using. This is how it does it. Um, the left side, why have the two sets of walls and not one in the middle? I don't know if I understand. Over here, the two sets of walls? Oh, oh, this part right here? That's because uh, when I first started doing this, um, I thought it would be a cool idea to do two sets of walls. Uh, and then I was like, that's going to take fucking forever. So I decided I would just do one set of walls. Uh, it's organic. It's an organic process. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I'm just figuring this stuff out. Uh, I think... I, th I don't know if there's really a right or wrong way to do it. I mean, the less joints is best, is all I've heard so far. Uh, there we go. Oh, It just died. Oh, well. But the thing is, if it's real bad, you can just uh, move the dots around, which is amazing. I mean, I've had entire maps in Roll20 where I forgot like a secret door uh, and I had to, you know, I had to go and delete everything and start over. And this, it would just be like, oh, whoops. And you'd go and you'd just grab that piece of wall and you'd move it and you'd be like, now it's good. It's a lot more forgiving. Let's see. Yeah, this is gonna be my um, this is gonna be my uh, guinea pig map for sure, because I did a a huge dungeon that I'm using to play test uh, Giffy Gliss and Paradise Vale and Foundry in, and I that particular one didn't have a lot of thick walls like this. What the hell? Why are you making double walls? I get concerned sometimes that there's double walls and those double walls are going to um, cause lighting issues. I haven't encountered anything like that yet, but who knows. Alright, so that is... That is all the walls in this thankfully very small dungeon. Um, what I could do here for the fireplace is I could go and grab some of this here. Oh... Christ. All right. I hold down control and then I, there we go. Uh, I could do that with the terrain so they can see the fireplace, but they can't climb in the fireplace. 
we got skull guy poking out of the wall here. So same thing. I could hold down control there and go like that so that you, you could brush up against the skull, but you can't go in the skull. Uh, whether that really needs to happen or not, I don't know. I mean, it's a cool effect. Got some spikies coming out of the wall there. Here's another skull we could do that with. Uh, there we go. And some more skulls we could do that with. No! <laughs> Alright. Maybe? Okay. It's really upset. Are you drawing a line somewhere on the map that I don't know about? Okay. Alright. Uh, I'll come back for you later. You messy little... Little thing you. I also wish there was a way to add a joint in the middle of a wall. So like if I wanted these guys to all connect, I'd have to go back there and move it sort of deal. But that's not really the end of the world. Uh, let's see. No, wait, what? <laughs> uh, normal. There we go. And we'll get rid of this. Cool. All right. Okay. All this is looking good. All this is looking good. Now, we got to add some doors. So, we'll go to the door tool. We'll go here. And we will add a door. Oh my god. Nope, that broke too. Alright, we got the door. Bring it over. Okay. So the doors are kind of this weird indigo color. Which is cool, because they show up good against the yellow. And here we go. Not a perfect door, but that's okay. Uh, we already got that. We got this right here. And this right here. Let's see. Oh, there's another door right here. It's a heroic map, so it's going to have about 4,000 doors. Uh, here we go. They have one that's like uh, a desert, and it's just sand, and there's still like 14 doors. So I don't know how they do it. Uh, are there any other doors that we need to draw, or are the rest of them going to be clickables? Or not clickables, but... Alright. Oh, this map um, I got from a store. Yeah, all the Hero Quest maps are from Heroic Maps. Here's the... Here's the link to the map we're working with. All right. So I think I drew all the doors that needed to be drawn. Now I can just go through and double click and just label them as doors. I don't know which feels better. I think. Hmm. They're both equally tedious in their own ways. But I, I think honestly, it's probably easier just to go in and click on them as I go. Uh, let's see. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I know I, I, I should probably do one or the other because this is kind of dumb doing, doing two separate ones. Okay, door, door, door. I do like how they really stand out, though. When I'm zoomed out, I can see all the spots where doors should be. So that's really good. Uh, door, door, door. All right. Uh, we are dynamically lit. We are dynamically lit. So now that we have 
the walls in place, we should put down some light sources. So there's a number of ways we could do this. One is we could create torch torches uh, like we do in um, Roll20. You have an actor. The actor is a, you know, a, a fire graphic or whatever. And then it has light associated with it. And that's pretty cool. And I think I already have those ready to go. So uh, let's see. Create a folder. Call it templates. Not not ten plates. Templates. There we go. And then we'll make this folder orange. I just make the folders colors because I couldn't do it in roll twenty, so it feels pretty good to be able to do it over here. And then I have a folder called my multiverse. I want to say that I have torch in here. Nope, I didn't think to put my, my guys in that folder. Well, that's just a pain in the ass, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Hmm. I don't want to log out, log into the other one. The, see, the, the problem is the transmog tool for this isn't, isn't great yet. So, like, I can't transmog another one of my Foundry games into this game. I have to go to that game and then export and then come back to this game and import. So I can't actually like transmog from where I'm at. Um, so that's kind of a pain in the ass. So this is an opportunity to maybe make animated fire instead. That'd be kind of cool. I don't know. Oh, look at me accidentally locking doors. Cool. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Or I could just, on the lighting layer, I could just make lights, which is fine, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess in the time I've been complaining, I could have just made a new actor for it. These are all very good points that are being made. Um, all right. So I'm going to go here and show you how to make a light source. So I'm on the light tool. It's a light bulb. And then it's on another light bulb. And then you click and you drag. And the first circle is the bright light. And the second circle is the dim light radius. And what you could do is there's this mod called Dancing Lights, which is amazing. And if you enable it, uh, you can enable fire. And just the default for fire looks pretty dope. So I like using that for these things. So uh, this brazier, I am just going to select it. And I'm going to copy it. And we're just going to paste it onto every other brazier in the dungeon. Now, in order to not have these snap to the grid, I am holding down shift uh, before I let go of the left mouse button. And that ensures that when I drop it, um, it drops in a, in a decent spot. There we go. Otherwise, these will snap to grid, which I don't know why you would ever want your lights to snap to grid, but that's the setting. Oh, shit. All right. Well, I don't want to have to change the setting over and over again. I thought the default for fire was already good, but I haven't set up a fire light in a while because I was using my actors. All right. So, dancing lights can free grow them to fire. You want to enable dim blur. Otherwise, you're going to get a hard line between the bright light and the dim light. Thank you for uh, that reminder before I populated the entire dungeon. All right. Uh, okay. So, those settings should be good. All right. Um, the dim radius will fade with the bright note that the... Well, I guess I kind of want that too. All right. Man, how fancy do we want these lights to be? All right. What? God damn it. Okay. So I'm going to bring uh, Sir Ragnar over here. And uh, why can't you see Sir Ragnar? That's because your token doesn't have vision. There we go. So yeah, as Saragnar, you could see that's the 
That's the flickering of the fire. I actually don't think that is making light far enough. So let's go in there and change that. Uh, we'll go 30... No, 30, 60. There we go. And update it. All right, now we'll jump into Sir Ragnar and see what we can see. Hmm. Still getting a weird effect there. I should probably write down the settings for these lights uh, once I have them the way I want them. Hmm. All right, let's see. Lower the fire movement a little bit. And then I guess I will turn down the dim radius fading. See how that looks real quick. Mm, nah, the dim radius fading was good. There's still this like real hard line here otherwise. All right, so let's go back to the lights. 20 and 20 for blur. Okay. Let's see. There we go. And... Let's have a... Let's see. Speed lower is faster. So yeah, let's have the flicker be a little bit slower. And... All right, now we'll try it again. Well, now you can't see anything, dude. Did I kill it? What did I do to the light now? Hmm. Oh yeah, there's also this really annoying thing with um, <laughs> with dancing lights is that when you are using the mouse wheel to go up and down, if you mouse wheel while the cursor is over something with a slider, it will actually affect the slider. I mean, talk about a great decision on that particular front. All right. Let's see. So why aren't we seeing it at all now, I guess is the question. Hmm. Oh, it must have gotten turned up because of uh, me mousing over it. Okay. All right, we'll try again. Here we go. The torch module, I didn't feel like I needed the torch module because I had dancing lights. So, I don't know. I mean, you don't, you can't have so many, many modules. I know there's people that have like 80 or 90 modules, but I'm trying to avoid that. I like how that looks. If I drag him out of the darkness, he can see the darkness. And the darkness kind of continues down the hallway a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that that is good. All right. So let me go here and then grab this brazier and then populate it for the whole dungeon. All right. And I really need to just make actors and make sure they're in all of my um, global compendiums because I'm not going to, I don't want to have to set this crap up over and over and over again. So I need to have like a whole compendium folder that is just full of lights. So I don't have to keep setting up the lights over and over and over again. All right. Let's see. There we go. Man, there's so many of these. Okay. And then the rest will be torches. 
All right. So we'll go over to Sir Ragnar. How's this dungeon looking now, dude? That's good. It's like lit, but it's not like too lit. Yeah. It has kind of a sooty, dirty quality to it. And you can see here, he can see past these crenellations, um, even though there's like the, the terrain thing there, but I can't move past them, right? I'm like trying to move past them and I can't. And we'll go and check out that skull real quick in the top corner. Right, so there's these skulls and I can see the skulls clearly, but I can't move into the skulls. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, you can, it affects lights on your actors as well. So if I wanted the, that's the thing, I had actors built already that were like torches and fire and all that, but they're in my other game and I didn't bring them over to this one. But yeah, here I can't climb on the skulls, but I can see the skulls clearly. And you can even see that the skull starts blocking line of sight. That's how the terrain uh, works. It's really good for like trees and rocks and things like that. So very cool. And I love the look of the dancing lights because you can see the opacity changing as it dims away from the lights. And you can see that slow flicker of the fire. Uh, combined with the fact that you can zoom so far in in Foundry, it's so immersive compared to compared to Roll20. I really, really like it. All right, let's uh, build some more lights here. Uh, let's see. In this beautifully well-lit well, well -lit dungeon. All right, so we're going to go into this torture chamber. Mad science room. And... So at the bottom checkbox of the dancing light setting there's a button that updates all lights of the scene there's also a button that makes it a default lighting setting oh that's hype um okay and then what i would just change the um the specific lights distance i guess to keep the same fire effects on everybody else yeah i could see that actually working pretty good well shoot in that case i could just take this bonfire put the bonfire here and then go into this bonfire and lower it to what 40 20 and that would really be the only change I needed to make but yeah I could go down to the bottom here set as the default setting for lights and then if I needed to I could update all the lights here all right so that's a much smaller light source so I could copy that put that there oh thank you uh, and then I can put this here. And there we go. And I could put it... Okay, here are the other torches. Now these torches, I guess, could be even smaller. Yeah, because they're like little wall sconces. So what we'll do with these... Is we'll go in and we'll make these 3015s. Uh, same deal, so it's a little bit smaller. And again, we're just using the shift tool to make sure we have better placement control. Yeah, the cool thing that, uh, like a happy accident, I guess, that happened with using actors for your torches is we were testing out some mods earlier today and uh, a fireball killed like one of the torches. But we thought about it, and that's kind of exactly what a fireball would do, right? Like, a fireball would just burn out a torch. Um, so I did think it was kind of neat to have your actors, uh, or have your light sources be actors in the scene. Because with some of the mods that you could use in Foundry, you could inadvertently blow up, like, a light source with, like, one of your spells. Which would be kind of awesome. All right. Uh, and then we got this armory over here. Nice. Okay. Now, we're way behind schedule for building a dungeon, uh, by my own personal standards. Uh, normally I can knock out a four-hour HeroQuest one-shot in 90 minutes. Um, because 
I've been using Roll20 for so long. Um, but here, you could tell that I'm still dynamically lighting things, and I'm already at, like, the hour mark. Um, so this is going to be something <clears throat> that I will have to continually work at improving my speed and proficiency, etc., etc. Because right now, um, not, not too happy with the speed that I'm working at. All right, and then we have the opportunity here to make some weird, funky spell effects. So we're going to do one here. Uh, we're going to drag it out like that. There we go. And we're going to go in and really, really mess around with it. So instead of fire, we're going to make this a electrical. No, we're going to make it a fade. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Nah, let's make it a uh, blink. Okay. And then we could have it switch between a couple of different colors, which will be kind of cool. So we'll do a uh, hideous lime green. And then we'll do like an evil purple. And then we'll do... Hmm. What would be another great color to put there? Purple, blue... Maybe like a sickly kind of orangey color. There we go. Some real Halloween shit going on here. Um, we could lower the fade. There we go. Okay. Uh, enable dim color animation. Dim the lighting color along the light. Particularly use of having a blinking light turn off. Um, hmm. Okay. I think all of this should work. Uh, let's see. Do not change the alpha of the blink light. Only switch between the colors. Uh, nah, 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 nah. There we go. Alright, so we'll drag Sir Ragnar into this summoning chamber. And see what he sees in there. Oh my god. No, you're going to have a seizure. Oh my god, hold on. Uh, don't look. Don't look. Uh, that's not good. All right. <laughs> Why is it doing that? Okay. Um, hmm. It must be the timing. Speed. There we go. We want it to be real slow. Real slow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's try again, Sir Ragnar. No, no. Now we're like, eat at Joe's. Eat at Joe's Diner. This is also not good. God damn it. All right. Um, we're learning. It's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, let's see. Lower is faster, so we want it to be slow. Um, okay. And then... Maximum fade. Maybe like that this. Okay. We could probably lower these quite a bit. Alright. Let's see what happens now. Oh, Jesus Christ. I just, like, moused over something again that I don't know what I mount. Oh, the speed. <sighs> How? Alright. Why would you make it so that you could adjust these these dials with the mouse wheel i just don't understand okay um all right let's see what happens now it's still why is it like a disco light Let's see. Um, hmm. I have one of these that looks really, really good that I worked on, and I don't, I don't want to think back and imagine how long I worked on it, but I must have worked on it for a really long fucking time uh, to get it to look good. Maybe it wasn't a blink though. That could be the problem. I think it was a fade. Yeah, that's got to be what it was. All right, and I'm no longer using the mouse wheel to go up and down, so there's at least that going on. 
All right. Let's see if this solves the problem. There we go. Now it's spookily changing colors. Okay. Much better. Yeah. So that, you know why it was blinking? Yeah, because we made it blink. Yeah. The timing on some of your comments, guys, it's amazing. Because, like, I feel like you're being sarcastic to me. Because, like, I figure it out not looking at chat. And then I look over and it's like, oh, yeah. Um, okay. So that actually looks pretty damn cool. All right. So now the dungeon is dynamically lit. And it has walls. And it has a secret door. Uh, I think we're ready to populate this shiz. So... What does this dungeon have a bunch of? It has a bunch of traps. What did I not learn how to use today? Um, a mod that specializes in traps. It's called Trigger Happy. It allows you to create traps that are triggered by your players um, walking into them or onto them. So I might actually do this as a two-parter and come back and add the traps after I learn Trigger Happy because I think that would be pretty damn cool. All right, so what else could we put down in this dungeon in the meantime? Uh, let's see. There's a lot of traditional monsters, a lot of orcs, uh, femurs, goblins. Um, and then there are the four boss chaos warriors. So I did already uh, figure out who the four chaos warriors were going to be. And I did already find... Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a um there's going to be four different chaos warriors. They're going to represent the four different gods of chaos. So I already have that sorted out. I did pick out art for them. I didn't make the tokens for them yet. Um and I couldn't decide if I wanted to make them giphy bosses or if I just wanted to do what I usually do and just make up a bunch of shit and throw it onto a 5th edition monster. Uh, basically give them each legendary actions and uh, call it a day. Um, but what we can do, which is a really neat thing that you could do in Foundry that you can't do in Roll20, is journals. So I can actually start mapping out the dungeon with journals um, before I start putting stuff inside, which is neat. So if I've got four bosses, they're teleporting in, and then they are leaving. So in the adventure, they just come down the staircase. Now there is a cool rune on the staircase here. It does kind of look like a pretty dope place to get teleported into. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that will be the point of entry. My other option was to have them appear over here on this rune, uh, and then kind of spread out from there. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think if I do it here, it's kind of cool because this is essentially where peeps are going to be spawning from endlessly. Um, hmm. Wait, wait, wait. There's a lot of these on the floor. So, because chaos. Um, hmm. Where would be a good place for them to teleport in? Because the staircase seems like a bad idea. That seems like where I would constantly spawn reinforcements from. Like, you would not want to uh, spawn in right there. Maybe this dark alley right here. This would be kind of cool. And then you could climb up here if you wanted to. Uh, or you could continue down here on the ground. Yeah, I kind of like that. I like the implication that this is a ramp. This kind of ramps up a little bit. Um, Magic Circle, like, they hijack it, so they come in on this dude's Magic Circle. That would mean the first encounter of the adventure is fighting the person of magic, because I was going to have um, the champion of Zinch uh, just be in this room, working their dark magic. So that would be kind of hype. Like, you start the adventure with a boss fight. Like, right off the bat, boss fight. Um, you know what? That sounds really good. Let's just do that. They, uh, using their divination magic, spies, etc., they have hijacked this guy's summoning circle, 
and that's how they summon you or teleport you into the base is they teleport you right into his teleportation or her whoever their teleportation circle that's that's solid all right so we're going to call this um say point of entry and uh champion of uh, zinch okay So I'll just drag that right there. Uh, cool. So they teleport in here. And this is also, I guess, where they can leave from when all is said and done. Uh, they come out here. They see this vast expanse that leads down into the Underdark. It would be super cool if some kind of hideous creature could eventually be called up from the depths here. Um, I'm not sure what, though. Maybe endless swarms of fire bats or something. Something horrible like that would be kind of cool. Uh, so I'm just going to put potential uh, spawner. Keeping in mind that the more stuff they kill, the more powerful they're going to get. And anybody who's played any amount of video games is going to know that they could just sit here and build up their combat multiplier even higher uh, before they go and tackle the rest of of the dungeon okay and i like how you can like mouse over these and be reminded what they are oh it's so nice all right so we need three more bosses three more bosses so the other three are nurgle um who is a, who is the thing and uh he's the he is the god of disease so his champion's about poison, disease, that kind of stuff. Then we've got Slanesh, which is the chaos god of uh, sex, debauchery, um, low willpower, get, giving it to temptation, all that, all that stuff. And then there is Corn, who is uh, the blood god, the god of murder and slaughter and all that stuff. So I kind of feel. Uh, I feel like, oh my gosh, the next time a person would feel the third death save, they could have that die. All right, I will, I will write it down. Is this just for Hero Quest or is this for any of my games? Nice. All right. Because Sunday Group might need it. I don't know. They've got some tough stuff coming up. All right. Looking at what we've got here, I feel like Slanesh, they might be into like murder, murder porn dungeon, right? Like they might be into like torture dungeon type deal. So I feel like they, it wouldn't be far fetched for them to be in charge of like torturing prisoners. Um, hmm. But where would we put. Where would we put... Oh, okay, here's an alchemy lab. So this could be where the Nurgle person is located at. And then, I'll be honest, I feel like... I feel like Corn would have the most followers amongst orcs and goblins in the old world of Warhammer. So I feel like Corn would be the dude that gets to sit on the throne here. So... Now, the interesting thing is, based on where we started them, they exit this door... And right away, there's the door to go fight the champion of corn. Like, right off the bat. Uh, this dungeon could be done essentially in any order. Um, which is a little bananas. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, though. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. So, let's do this. Uh, we'll create another entry. And we'll call this champion of corn. No, no, no. Not of porn. Of corn. There we go. Okay. Champion of corn is in here. And then we got champion of Slanesh. Uh, operates out of these torture chamber areas. Go. 
show. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, if they're too if they're too loud or rowdy or whatever. Now here's the thing. I like the idea of Corn having like a bunch of dudes in his feast, like in here having like a feast essentially. So champion of Selenesh, they've already got prisoners. The prisoners are screaming from torture and all that jazz. So they probably don't hear, or if they hear a fight in here, they just assume it's like Corn and their buddies like fighting. Uh, same deal. If they hear a bunch of screaming from this room, these guys are probably going to think that this person is just having a really good time at work torturing people. Um, this person is going to be over here uh, essentially doing their own thing. You know what I want to do, though? I want to go into the walls, and I want to add a secret door that leads uh, into this temple area. So they have two secret doors in this room. One that leads to this gargoyle and one that leads to this secret area. Alright. So let me be really lazy and then draw another one of these um, ugly uh, S's. There we go. Yeah! <laughs> Alright, cool. Okay. So that works. All right. Hmm. Okay. So that'll lead there. I like the idea that they could be in either room that way if we build a secret door. So... If things are going too easy for them, we could have the Nurgle guy jump out. If things are going too, uh, too bad for them, Nurgle guy definitely doesn't hear, doesn't come out. But this is like Nurgle's area. It's over here. Uh, so that works. Okay. Alright, so we've got this champion in Nurgle. Yeah, it's um it is Warhammer. So it's it's old 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 school Warhammer. So I think even before Bretonia and all that kind of stuff like the the old 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 world when the races of good were trying their best and chaos was still trying their best to you know keep control of everything. It was the the darkest ages essentially. I'm not a huge lore buff for Warhammer, but um, it's the simpler times of good versus evil. Anybody that wasn't working for Chaos was essentially a good guy by default because Chaos was just that bad uh, sort of thing. All right. Um, I guess if I had any complaint, it would be... Huh... No, I think the layout for this dungeon is pretty good. I think starting in this room isn't isn't necessarily a bad thing. And if we look, we kind of did it right. Uh, we've got a Chaos Warrior in the big room with the table. we got a Chaos Warrior in this room right here. Nope, you don't, you don't need to do that. Thank you, Windows. Uh, we've got a Chaos Warrior over here in the study... And then we got a Chaos Warrior over here in the weapons area. So instead of in the weapons area, we have them over here in the torture area. But we kind of got them almost all in the same place. So that's cool. All right. What does the adventure mention that we should not forget? Let's see. Um, there is an armory. Uh, the first hero who searches for treasure will find a shield. This shield is exactly like the one described and the armory on the cardboard platform. All the other weapons here are unusable. That makes sense in the best fortress that they have for their whole fucking army. But it is a board game, so I guess it is what it is. Um, what else we got? Uh, the gargoyle appears to be a stone statue that does not move. 
but the treasure chest is a trap. If a hero searches for treasure before the trap is disarmed, the gargoyle will spring to life and immediately attack. If a hero disarms the trap first, he will discover, be told by you, that what would have happened if he had searched for treasure. The gargoyle cannot be harmed until it has either moved or attacked a hero. Eh, we'll be flexible on that one. Uh, and then what do we got here? Uh, this Chaos Warrior has a magic sword. Whomever kills the Chaos Warrior may take the sword as its prize. The sword is the artifact known as Orcsbane, and it is explained on the matching artifact card. Now, I always thought this was kind of jacked up, because, like, this guy, you know, to everybody's an orc. Like, so your boss has a sword that's good at killing orcs? That feels kind of kind of messed up but as i got older and i i actually got a job i realized how important it is that your subordinates know that you have a weapon that's good at killing them uh and this is why the champion of corn is the boss because he has orc slayer um i also realized after years of dming that what greater weapon for a chaos warrior to have than one that he had taken from a champion of the light. So Orc Slayer will of course be a uh, dope-ass sword that was used by champions of the light to fight orcs, and now it is in the hands of this chaos warrior, and the chaos warrior uses it um, to instill fear in their own minions, and also to stick it to the, uh, the good guys, I have your sword, Nanny, nanny, boo boo. So, that's what's going on there. Uh, so, this could be an opportunity to use the create magic item thing. Because there's a module for making magic items. I can't rightly recall how it works, though. Um, let's see. <laughs> hmm. Crap. Uh, Alright, let me go and check my tutorials real quick. Uh, let's see. Magic items. Here we go. Makes magic items. It sure does. Uh, give me the instructions again. Alright, alright. Install it. Once activated, a new tab named Magic Items will be available for each item. Okay, let's see. Uh, adds the ability to create magic items with spells or feats. Cool, 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 cool. Where am I making these magic items, though? Uh, create actor, NPC, vehicle. Uh, let's see. I think I make it on the actor themselves. So I need a Chaos Warrior. All right. So let me go to Core Monsters, Chaos Warrior. We're going to duplicate this Chaos Warrior. And we're going to call this Chaos Warrior the Champion of Corn. Alright. And this Champion of Corn is going to get a lot of steroids. So don't worry about them at all. Uh, let's see. Features. Uh, inventory. Add new. New loot. Okay. Uh, no. No. I don't think this is how I did it. Hmm. Let's see. Where is this new tab to make magic items from? Hmm. Are you a new weapon? Okay, I feel like we're getting closer here. Oh, there it is. Magic item. Bam. There's the tab. Okay, so we're going to call this Orcsbane. Is it one Orcsbane, or is it all Orcsbanes? We'll just call it Orcsbane. There we go. And we get to select an adorable Worlds of Warcraft token, which is one of my favorite parts. Uh, so let's go in here, and I keep meaning to pick up, like more of these packs because I don't know, I just think they're really cool. Um, let's find a dope looking sword if one is available. 
Nope. Okay. Oh, right, right, right. Because your inventory. We want weapons. Uh, none of you really look like an orc's bane. I'll have to find appropriate art. Um, for now, we'll just use you. Okay. So we've got orc's bane. We go over to magic items. Is this magical? You bet it is. All right. What does this magic item do? Um, does it have any charges? I didn't really really think about that. Uh, let's look at these details. So this is a martial melee weapon. Uh, that's cool. Uh, activation cost, it's one action. Do I really have to add all this stuff in? Oh, Jesus. Um, hmm. Okay, and we got weapon attack. Uh, it's a normal melee attack. Is this where I would add, like, the extra bonuses? Uh, default attack roll bonus. There we go. So we're going to say it's a plus two sword. Yeah, that works. And let's see. Damage formula. Uh, is this where I would add extra damage? How do I just make it a plus two sword? Maybe if I look at a plus two sword... I would have a better idea of what I'm doing with this. So, all right, let me go to Compendium and we'll go grab a plus two sword real quick. Uh, this guy, items. All right, uh, plus two weapon. Is that as good as we get? All right, drag this in. Oh, you're just down there? Okay. All right, what about a draconic longsword? What does that look like when we get under the hood? Okay, uh, it's versatile. It has no bonus to attack rolls. It has no bonus to damage rolls. Ugh, this is terrible. Is it a magic item? It is, but not in the way that you're asking. Hmm. So if you set this stuff up correctly, this is why I'm trying to do this. If you set this stuff up correctly, and a character's like, like Sir Ragnar, right? He's like, cool beans, I killed this champion of corn, I'm going to take Orcsbane, right? You could just left-click and drag Orcsbane off of Champion of Corn onto Sir Ragnar, and just like that, dude's got, dude's got it. It's added. That's it. That's all you had to do. So there's a certain payout to setting certain items up correctly, because then you can just take them from one person and drag them to another person, uh, which is amazing. So that's part of why I want to have it set up correctly um, when I'm when I'm doing this. Uh, that being said, I don't actually know yet how to build a good magic item. What does Orcsbane do? Uh, it's going to do extra damage against orcs. That's that's literally what it does. It rolls extra damage dice against orcs. Uh, so it's like a giant bane or a dragon slayer weapon, but against orcs. I know it's not the greatest weapon of all time, but uh, that that's what it does. So I was going to make it like a plus two longsword that also does extra damage to orcs. So I'm not really sure what else I could do with that. Plus, if it's a longsword, I don't really know if anybody's going to bother to use it. So maybe it should be a greatsword. Uh, click the plus by damage formula right here. Okay. Oh, and this is where it would add the extra orc damage. Got it. So it normally does 2d6 slashing damage. No, 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 wait. It would do 2d6. What the hell is the label for? Slashing. And then it would do 2d6 uh, orc damage. Hmm. I think it'll just do force damage to orcs. Orc slaying. There we go. Okay. Everything else here should be fine the way it is.
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Label put on orcs. Got it. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. And then I could also give it... Oh, you know what would be cool? Uh, if we gave it, like, Hunter's Mark. Since we don't have a ranger in the party, that might be kind of fun. Uh, so we'll give it... I don't know. Uh, one charge. Yeah. And then we could drag over that spell. Uh, let's see. Do I have spells? Uh, yeah, we got spells. Hunter's Mark. There we go. Sweet. Okay. So, there we go. So the Orcsbane will allow you to cast Hunter's Mark. And we'll give it... I don't know. Three. Because it does use Concentration. Yeah. Uh, do you destroy it at zero? You don't. Is it rechargeable? Uh, it recharges its charges daily. There we go. So each adventure you can use it three times. Yeah, that works. That's a pretty cool sword then. All right. All that seems pretty solid. Um, weapon properties. Uh, let's see. It would be a heavy weapon. And it'd be a two-handed weapon. And all this other stuff is good. Let's close it out. And let's see how it works. So we're going to only roll to ourself by changing to blind GM roll. And we'll go to the actor, champion of corn. We'll get rid of this draconic sword. And orc spain. We'll go ahead and roll it. All right. Uh, wow, 26. Not a bad attack roll. It's only doing 2d6. And an extra 2d6 orc slaying. So what are we missing here on this weapon? Uh, let's see. Damage formula. Hmm. It should be adding strength. Which is the default. So why is it not adding strength? Uh, ability modifier is default. Hmm. Open up my what? My 2d4 plus what? Uh, let's see. That seems like it's being modified correctly, but the damage itself is being modified correctly. What if I change it to strength? Will it work now? Let's see. Uh, nope. It's still not adding that in. Oh, 2d6 plus attack mod. Okay, got it. Okay. I would have thought, since I had default up here, that it would know to do that by default. Okay. Oh, but then it wouldn't make sense if it did it by default, because then it would still apply it to the orc slaying. Also, mm, I get it. Uh, and then to make it a magical plus two, we add another plus two to it. There we go. All right. Now we have a magic item that actually works. So go ahead and click that. Now it's doing 17 fucking damage. Oh my god. Um, that's much better. And then all these bonuses to attack. Excellent. Okay. And then if, say, Sir Ragnar came along, killed him, and took the weapon from him. Uh, here we go. So Champion of Corn. Uh, versus Sir Ragnar. Okay, what? Mm. Okay. Alright, and then he died, and Sir Ragnar took his sword. Sir Ragnar now has Orcsbane. Sir Ragnar could roll on it. And 
it suddenly does uh yep more damage because he's a stronger guy plus the orc slaying damage beautiful okay Uh, does it need to be attuned? It does. It does. Otherwise, well, yeah. I mean, a weapon that's strong should probably be attunable, since it casts magic and stuff. But since it's so specialized in that it only really hurts orcs, uh, maybe we won't make it attunable. That would be kind of cool. So, I think we'll just leave it as is. Because a, a giant slayer in D&D &D does not actually have to be attuned. And that is... Yeah, because it's such a specialized thing. All right. That works. So we have it lit. We have the treasure that we're supposed to have for the dungeon. We have the bosses chosen. Uh, let's see. So anything else in this adventure that we're supposed to have? Um, Chaos Warrior with a Magic Sword. Wandering Monsters are Femirs. And there's just a buttload of orcs. Uh, goblins and Famirs. And they all carry different values when you kill them. Plus the gargoyle. Uh, on, yeah, I think that's that then. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. So, uh, I could go here and do an items shared Okay. And unlock it. Wait. Not item shared. Uh where's my multiverse? Nope. Those are the spells. Um here we go. Item shared. Yeah, that was the right one. And I'll unlock it. And then I could go back to this chaos warrior and drag Orcsbane over. And now we have a copy of Orcsbane. Or we're supposed to. Uh, forever? Let's see. Hmm. That's kind of weird. Briefcase on the left. What? Oh, briefcase. Got it. I have yet to actually use this items tab. So I have to drag it here to make it an item. Then if I wanted to throw it into the compendium. I would go to the briefcase tab. Where the hell did the briefcase tab go? Oh, uh, okay. And then I could drag it over to here. Nope, that's still not adding it. Hmm. That's weird. All right. Oh, you know what? I know why it's not showing up there. I've added it over and over and over again, but it it didn't clear the search field from the last time I searched that. So let's do this. And we'll clear that. And we'll actually tell it to look for Orcsbane. And we got like four or five copies of it. Fuck yeah. All right, cool. <sighs> I was feeling super confident before I sat down to build this dungeon. Uh, but, wow. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, mm, okay. So, to populate Foundry, that part, at least, is pretty pretty basic. We take what you want, you drag it in, it rolls some rando hit points for him, which is fantastic. It gives him a random name, the Synergistic uh, Orc Juggernaut. He's in there polishing weapons and taking care of stuff. Uh, so then if I want some orcs and gabos to be hanging out in this room, I would just keep dragging orcs in here. Uh, no problem. Grab some goblins, same deal. And the problems that you roll into in, with roll 20 of like, are there hit points linked? If I reduce hit points from one, is it going to happen to all the others? It's not going to happen. Um, which is a really, come on guys. <laughs> Which is a really cool thing. Uh, there we go. Some slight delay there. Venturesome Orc is definitely down for whatevs. Uh, disappearing Orc 
clocks in for his shift and then spends a lot of time just playing on his phone in the bathroom. Uh, but you get the idea. Like, you could do all sorts of, like, cool stuff with these. Um, yeah, so that's really neat. And then all it's going to take is somebody to come in here with a fireball, and then all these all these guys are dead. Now, the important thing about this mission is to have too many bad guys. Just so many basic bitch bad guys. So we're going to have an ogre in here. Uh, we're going to have goblins, famirs out the wazoo. This guy's cooking a dwarf over here. Uh, this guy's tapping some kegs. Yeah, we're just going to just fill this dungeon up with way, way, way too many people. Because this is supposed to be a bastion of chaos. There's just supposed to be a lot of bad guys here. And I want to make sure that that is recreated. Uh, let's see. We'll have another ogre in here. She's the cook. So she's in here making some beads on the fire. There we go. This is the kitchen area. Uh, then we've got some other people in here that are doing some stuff. Um, this is where the Nurgle guy is going to be. This is going to be where we spawn a bunch of stuff. So we'll go back to our journal tab. And we'll put reinforcements. Re in points. All right. And then we could always add more information to reinforcements later. Uh, but for now, this is where reinforcements will come from. They'll come down these stairs as needed. I like this pointless outer wall. I don't know why. I really like it. Uh, let's see. We'll have a Shrine to Chaos here. Where you can get blessings from Nurgle. Or any of the four uh, gods. All right. I think they have actually prayed at one of these shrines before, and they got really janked up. So I don't think they're going to do it again, but you never know. Adventurers are very self-destructive. Uh, let's see. Will this person have any assistance whatsoever? Mm, probably. Probably have them poured in some bad guys uh, during the fight. Out in the courtyard area, we could have some people on patrol. We could actually even set them up to be on patrol, which would be kind of cool. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, we'll get rid of Sir Ragnar. And uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and grab some orcs. Or a orc. Here we go. All right, and I think if they're patrolling, they actually have to have vision enabled. So we'll turn that on for them. And they have, what, 60 foot dim vision? Uh, let's see. There we go. Good for you, little orc. And we could actually have this dude patrol like the whole place, which would be kind of fun. All right. So, we will set his first waypoint here. Um, and then his next waypoint can be here. Sweet. And next waypoint will be here. Uh, he'll go to here. Look down this passageway a little bit. Uh, and then he'll go back up to here. And then he'll go over to here. Uh, maybe he'll walk up to the edge. That's inviting. Uh, and then he'll go down to here. And then we'll have to go to here. <laughs> and here. I mean, he's one orc, so I don't know why I'm doing this, honestly. Um, other than to just play around with the uh, patrol module.
All right, and then yeah, that would be. that okay so then we could just have him patrol i guess uh let's see is there anything else we need to worry about for his patrol mm. uh let's see he doesn't rotate he just walks around we could have him say zug zug once in a while but that's the wrong campaign setting um let's see vision yep uh, yep. Okay. And then he'll pause the game when he sees some, uh, some people. And, uh, that'll be fine. Alright, and then we'll go ahead and have him start his route. Okay. Kind of jump down the battlements, that's fine. And he starts patrolling the dungeon. He goes down here, he looks around. Okay, heads back up. Uh, heads over here. He looks down there. That's cool. Oh, so cute. I don't know. It's kind of neat. There was an adventure way early on where they had to escape from prison. It would have been kind of fun to set them on um, patrols. And then they had to sneak past the patrols or whatever. Now, does he jump down or does he turn back around? Oh, he turns back around. Nice. Okay. So, so we've got that guy. Uh, roaming around doing his patrols. That's cool. Uh, and then we can throw some more bad guys in here. So many orcs. Uh, maybe another orc juggernaut. There we go. Now, there's no lady orcs in Warhammer, which has always been fascinating to me, because they're mushroom creatures. Like, I guess they're all technically plants. By 5th edition standards. There is a certain amount of lingering that happens when you go to select, um, like, a new token, where it'll still be selecting the other token. We don't want to lock the ogre up and in their kitchen. That's not very nice. Alright. Uh, all that works pretty good. We'll throw a couple of goblins down at the bottom of the stairs here. Cool. Alright. Uh, let's see. Some acolytes in here would be pretty good. I don't have any acolytes currently set up, so I'll have to do that. Uh, some prisoners would be good. So we could set those up. And then I feel like Slanesh, they might have some uh, skeletons or something. Item drop lets you draw, drag images, DLC files directly to Foundry, and the mess module has a ton of nice features in it. I heard the mess module can have a lot of compatibility issues, depending on what other mods you're using, which is why... I am not using the mess one. I hadn't heard of item drop though, so I will check item drop out. But I heard mess can um, can fight with others pretty easily. Mostly because there's a whole bunch of stuff that mess does already. So if you have other ones that you're using and mess is like, I wanted to do that, that's when they start to kind of fight and argue with each other. All right, we're going to give this dude two ogres. There we go. Which is nothing for a seventh level party. It's nothing. Uh, and then we're going to give him a lot of orcs. But I do like that all the orcs have different hit points. And different, like... <laughs> different adjectives and different numbers so I could keep track of all the different orcs of the dungeon and I also like that in the corner of my peripheral vision I see this one orc just slowly and ponderously <laughs> making his way along his route through the fortress that means a lot to me uh, alright so Slanesh uh, they'll have some Femirs working for him in here. 
There we go. And a few goblins, because goblins in this setting are extra nasty. Not as nasty as Famir, but still pretty nasty. Alright. Sweet. So, what I would need to do then is stat out the four different bosses. Uh, get those set up. And then uh, the tokens for them. And then pretty much done. One thing I am missing is I miss my treasure decks. So I'm not 100% sure how to set up decks. I know that you can because I see that there's a playing card deck right here. Um, so I'm prob I am probably could just migrate over the decks, I guess, from Foundry. Uh, or sorry, from Roll20, like the treasure decks that I like to use. But I'm not sure how you randomly pull a card out of a deck. So I have to look up and figure out how decks work. God. Every time I do something with Foundry, I end up with like fucking ten more things that I have to do with Foundry. Alright. And then we still need to add traps. So we need to put some traps in places uh, that the bad guys would know about them, but the good guys would not to sort of add to the um, what the hell factor. But yeah, overall, overall, um, we have a functional dungeon here. If I had more, I guess, infrastructure set up on this particular Roll20 game, not I keep calling it Roll20 game, on this particular Foundry game, if I had uh, my compendium set up correctly, if I had more monsters set up, it would be a little bit easier. Again, part of the speed when I build stuff in Roll20 is I already have everything I need and I already know where it is, so I could just sort of drag stuff in and I'm good to go. Um, I'm still building all that foundation uh, over here in Foundry, so that's still a thing I gotta worry about. Um, not really sure what to do about this room in between here. I feel like we could have something cool there as well. That might be a good opportunity to throw some undead or maybe something spicy. I'm not sure. I feel like the four bosses might be spicy enough. But uh, maybe this dude just keeps a mummy in here. as like a doorman. Yeah, that could work. An immature mummy. Aw. They called you immature, man. It's really rude. Hmm. I don't know. Either way, I like the way that it looks. I like the way that it plays. Um, and then once you get a combat going and you get the turn tracker moving and the dynamic lighting and the automatic spells, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but I would say that I'm not 100% ready to run this uh, by Wednesday night, so I am going to have to put a little bit more work into this. So I might continue to prep this uh, on tomorrow night stream. But for now, I want to grab something to eat and get ready because after a week off, we've got Evil Tides of Saltmarsh Moon tonight. So that's a thing. <clears throat> They're almost at the very end of the campaign. So I want to make sure that I go in and I reacquaint myself with Roll20 and the adventure thus far and what challenges they have ahead and all that good stuff after I grab something to eat. So, thanks everybody for hanging out. Sorry for my uh, lack of proficiency in Foundry. I'm still learning uh, 20 days into the month. I'm still learning stuff. Uh, it is a very deep program. Uh, I'm trying my best. So, for everybody who's helping out in chat, uh, the great sage of Foundry, Dom, I really appreciate it. And um, as I continue to build out this uh, this this whole experience, I'm going to try my best to share what I'm learning with everybody so that other people that are trying to do Foundry, uh, it'll be a little bit easier for them.